Good morning, Northside. Good morning. What a great day to worship. Thank you for joining us, whether you're in person or online. We are delighted that you want to share the privilege of worship with us this morning. And uh, we are here to praise God and to hear his word proclaimed. What could be better than that? We'd like to know about you. We have these in the back, or we have a nice little QR code. By the way, y'all. Lisa and I had the, had the uh, uh, honor of uh, visiting a church where I grew up. They asked us to come and lead worship a few weeks ago, and we showed up down there, and guess what? They had these. It's gone viral. It's an amazing thing. It's a connect card, and we'd like to know about you, your name, who you are. If you're a visitor especially, we'd like to know that you were with us and welcome you. Uh, but also, if you just have information you want to share, uh, this is the way to share it with our staff, either on this card or through the QR code or through our website, which is uh, nschristianchurch.org. You can email office at nschristianchurch.org or any of our staff members by their first name. So uh, whichever way you choose and which preferable to you, we want to know about you and what, uh, what your needs are, what you'd like from us, and uh, just that you were here with us in worship. So welcome again. Especially welcome again our veterans and thank you as we continue to celebrate what you've done for us that allows us to be here today. What a great uh, privilege that you were willing to uh, give the greatest sacrifice of all perhaps in order to preserve our ability to gather here and worship. Uh, what, a, what a thing to honor. Let's do that this morning. Stand with me as we pray and uh, then we'll begin our worship and song. Father, we are privileged to gather in your name. We know that... There are places in our world that, that people have to do this secretly and at danger to even their own life. But we can come together freely and worship you and honor you in the way that you want us to do because of who you are. You're the creator, you're our savior, you love us, and you want us to gather in your name and honor you. And we do that this morning. We just pray that everything we do here would bring you honor, that we would lift up your name and praise you for who you are. And we just ask that you be in every part of this service, the worship and song, the declaring of your word, the decision time, whatever it might be, that uh, you would be at the center of it always. And we ask this through the name of Jesus. Amen. One, two, three, four.
morning. Our scripture today is from the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 86, uh, verses 1 through 5 and 11 and 12. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I long and I call for you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. Amen. You may be seated. And mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity.
from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the rose from their tombs and the angels stood in all for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born in the spirit lit a flame and this gospel truth alone shall not be shall not be by his blood 
Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. I want to welcome you to Northside. Those of you online as well, we're glad you're here with us. And uh, we're able to join in this time together. Worship team, as always, thank you so much for leading us this morning uh, into the message. Uh, we always try to coordinate these things and, uh, you know, so that we are on message and uh, uh, just sort of working in sync together uh, around the topic today. And we, today we're continuing on in this series, The Content Life, uh, just talking about how do I live with more contentment in the midst of all these things going on in my life and around me in the world, how do I live in more contentment. I'll share with you a story. A man walked into his doctor's office and said, Doctor, I have this awful headache that it will never leave me. Can you give me something for it? I will, said the doctor, but I want to check a few things out first. Tell me, do you drink a lot of liquor? Liquor? The man said indignantly. I never touch the stuff. How about smoking? I think tobacco is disgusting. I've never in my life touched tobacco. I'm a bit embarrassed to ask this, but you know the way some men are. Do you do any running around at night? Of course not. What do you take me for? I'm in bed every night by 10 o'clock at the latest. Tell me, said the doctor, the pain you speak of, is it a sharp shooting kind of pain? Yes, said the man. It, that's it. It is a sharp shooting kind of pain. Simple, my dear fellow. Your trouble is you have your halo on too tight. All we need to do is loosen it a little bit. <laughs> do you know anyone with their halo on too tight? And before you answer that question, let me just warn, answering that question with the name of anyone else but ourselves probably suggests that we're the ones with a too tight halo. <laughs> Share with you another story. Dr. Megan McKenna was one speaking to a group of graduate students about the religious environment in which Jesus' ministry took place. This was, of course, a, a, uh, a course in a Bible college that was being taken by these graduate students in the seminary. And she, she wanted to kind of help them get a feel for the, the environment that Jesus' ministry took place in. She wanted to give them a real-life experience to help them see the judgmental attitudes of the time and, frankly, to see that those judgmental attitudes are actually still pretty prevalent uh, even in our own time today. So she told everybody in her, in her class, she said, let's do a little exercise right here in the classroom. Uh, where all of those of you who don't smoke, stand up. And, uh, and all of those people who, you know, didn't smoke, and she's like, they stood up. And she said, I want you to go over to the left side of the left, the left wall of the classroom. Okay? Those of you, how many, and those of you who are reformed smokers, those of you who did smoke, but now you've given it up, I want you to sit in the, in the center of the room. And those of you who are still smokers, today I want you to go and, and go to the right wall of the room. And so the class followed her instructions, and they did, you know, as she had instructed. And it broke down sort of like this. That when she said, you know, the, if, you don't, if you've never smoked before, go to the left wall of the room. There were about 30 people in the class who got up and they went to that wall. When it came to those who were reformed smokers, those who had given it up and they once did, but now they've quit, those people, they, there was about 12 of them, and they stood in the middle of the room. When it came to those who still smoked, three of them got up and went to the right, the right side of the room. And you could tell one of those, of those three stated there was an immediate sense of separation that was so obvious, right? This is what happens, right? Label, 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 and now there's all the assumptions about those labels that are now all of a sudden in the room, like these big elephants in the room. We just got through a week where we kind of do the same thing, right? We just got through a week of elections where you get this label and this category and this assumption about you, and you get this label, and this category, whether it's red, blue, a D or an R or whatever it is, an independent, whatever, we put all those labels on, immediately there's a sense of separation, <laughs> and, and there, all of a sudden you can feel this tension, and that was what happened in this moment. Then Dr. McKenna asked two questions. First, how do you feel about the current smoking regulations on campus in restaurants, airports, the corporate world, and so forth? How do you feel? She asked the whole class, as they were sitting in their groups, this question. All three groups unanimously agreed that the regulations were good, that they were ecologically important, and they were sensitive to the health and the welfare of others. Across all three groups, same reaction. Then came the second question. How do you feel about smokers personally? Now, stuff starts to change. 
keep in mind the split. 30 people who said they've never smoked, 12 who once did but now no longer do, three who said, hey, I, that's still me. How emboldened do we get when we have this perception that we're in the majority or that we are, that, you know, there, there's more of us than there is them, whoever them is. We get emboldened by that, and that's exactly what played out in this classroom. Once that question was posed, one of the non-smokers, one of the group of 30, was very blunt. They're disgusting and inconsiderate. Another non-smoker said this, Obviously, anyone who smokes has low self-esteem and a lousy self-image. Obviously? Like, obviously? Like, we can just make that general conclusion? Well, obviously, this is the problem, right? Uh, man, big generalizations, huge sweeping judgments. One person said they have no willpower. Rotten role models for teenagers. Another person, keep in mind, this is a seminary setting, right? I have serious questions about the quality of their faith and the depth of their personal relationship with Christ. Do they know they're poisoning the atmosphere? Step back to the first question for a moment. The first question, everybody agreed it was an environmental issue, a health issue, and every, all three groups. And this person comes up and says, do they know they're poisoning the atmosphere? Whew, wow, to change. And then imagine being one of the three people in the room who was a smoker. One of them said this in that moment as she described what was going on. She said it felt like she, she cowered against the wall, feeling like the woman caught in adultery. Suddenly the environment was really hostile, despite the fact that these were her classmates. She had prayed with these people. She had worshipped with these people. She had picnicked. She had studied. She had conversed with them. Like, they had relationships. And she felt like they were, if they had stones present, they'd have stoned her. The bell sounds. Everyone leaves the room in silence, as you can imagine. The next day, Dr. McKenna was very strategic in what she was doing here. The next day, she wanted the very first thing to ask them their impressions of what had happened the day before. She asked them to share their feelings and their reactions to the previous day. She gave them all night to think about it, to let the Holy Spirit kind of do its work. And it's amazing. One of the women who was in the non-smoking group, who has actually been one of the most, said some of the most incendiary, harshest things about, about the smoking group, she said this about herself the next day. She said, yesterday I learned something about myself. I need a lot more compassion for people who are different than me. And then on the other side of that, and the, the, one of the women who was in the group of those who had been smokers, who felt so incredibly judged, she said this, when I was standing against the wall, I actually thought, like I said before, the group number one people would have thrown stones at us if they were available. And then I realized how difficult it was for me to look at them and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Brennan Manning is the one who shares this story in his book. It's been out now for a number of years, The Ragamuffin Gospel. And in that, as he summarizes this story in his own words and recounts this words, here's what he says. We miss Jesus' point entirely when we use his words as weapons against others. They are to be taken personally by each of us. We miss Jesus' point entirely when we use his words as weapons against others. They are to be taken personally personally by each of us personally there are times when myself and this happens to a lot of my colleagues who who are in ministry who are preachers we'll get approached by people and I don't think the the intent is always you know at the very face of it it's not really an ill intent when people do this but they come they'll come up to me and they'll say you know what what we need are more sermons on and you fill in the blank <laughs> And usually when it has to do with the topic of sin, it's usually whatever the sin is that they love to rant about. Usually it's something that they are very good at, something that's really not an issue for them, but it's an issue for other people. Uh, that's what we do. We always take the thing that we excel in and we make it all important and then we judge other people by it. And that's where that judgmental spirit comes from. And people say, oh, we need more sermons on, on blank. And I want to respond by saying, has that been a struggle for you? And then, you know, I can imagine what the, what the reactions might be. It's never their sin. It's always somebody else's. Those of us who've been in the church for years have probably heard someone use this phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. And uh, I know I've used that phrase before. You've probably used that phrase before. I'm going to tell you, I've come to the point I don't like that phrase. And here's the reason I don't. I don't have time to hate your sin. 
There's too many of you to hate everybody's sin. I, it's a full-time job hating the sin in my own life. It's a full-time job hating the sin. I don't, I, there's too many other people I, to, to hate all your sin. I, I, I'm a full-time job hate, hating my own sin. And so as comedian Mark Lowry states, how about you hate your sin, I'll hate my sin, and let's just love each other. How about that? A lot of us today haven't found contentment in life because we haven't found humility. We haven't found humility. We're busy trying to fix the world around us before we fix ourselves. And all the while, our, our self continues to be in turmoil, just waiting. It's like, when are you going to deal with me? <laughs> because you're so busy out there. And actually, it's a distraction we often use. We're so distracted by trying to fix it that we distract ourselves from the work we've got to do in our own lives. And so it's hard for our souls to find any relief from the torment they're in because we're not dealing with them. I want you to take a look with me today at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. One of Jesus' parables that he shares there is a very, very short and brief parable, but a very powerful one at the same time. Luke chapter 8, verse 18, verse 9, excuse me. Jesus says this. As he says, he told this, par- this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God. Be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. And then Jesus told his audience this. He said, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Daryl Bach is a well-studied theologian, wrote a commentary on the book of Luke. And in that commentary, here's what he says about this passage. He says, this parable is really the parable of the two prayers. In those prayers appear two kinds of hearts, whose contrast is not only seen in the way they make their requests, but also in the way they approach God. It's the parable of really two prayers. Two prayers. Two people who, have, who, ha, who approach God in very different ways, and they give us insight into where they're at spiritually, Jesus is, you know, by how they approach God. Notice the differences in the way they approach God and the way they pray. Number one, the Pharisee makes himself the subject of his prayer. <laughs> he makes himself the center of his prayer. He starts out appearing to pray this prayer of praise. I thank you, God. It's almost, it starts out like a psalm, like it's almost like a psalm of David. You know, I thank you, God. You are, you know, and David writes all these psalms. You are my fortress. You're my deliverer. You're my rock. All these things. We, we see these prayers of praise that David writes in psalms. And it starts out that way. You're thinking, okay, this is good. You'd think, though, that if you were going to express thanks to God, then you would assume, like, what follows that I thank you, God, would be specific gratitude for things that God has done or blessings that he has given that otherwise would not have been yours. As though, like, you know what, God, if not for you, I would not be this thing, you know, or I would not have this, or I would not, you know, all of these, these, I would not have this at my disposal or have this blessing. But this man's prayer is really, a, it's really an expression of how grateful is he is for himself. That's really what he's praying. Nothing in his prayer would suggest he has any need for God at all. He's done it all himself. Five times in just two verses, this Pharisee in Jesus' story uses the first person singular pronoun, which means he makes himself the subject of the prayer. He is the subject of his own prayer. And he's essentially saying this, thank you, God, that I'm so great. I mean, it's almost as though he's going to God and saying, God, you should really be thankful I'm on your team. I mean... Imagine what it would be like if we weren't together. I mean, if you didn't have me, oh, God, oh. Let's, thank, let's just be thankful we don't have to live in that reality, God. We don't. I'm reminded of the warning of the words of Proverbs 27, verse 12. Let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. How do we approach God? 
Have we ever stepped back to observe the language of our prayer life? You sit there and you look at, at the way we pray. Are we preaching to God? Are we preaching to Him or are we, are we seeking Him? Do, do we make statements at God in our prayers or do we submit to God in our prayers? Do we pray telling God what to do or do we pray ready to receive what He tells us to do? Whose kingdom are we trying to build when we pray? Whose kingdom are we trying to build when we pray? I'll never forget about the time David Hampton met his AA sponsor, Stuart. And I've shared this story before. I love it because it's just a poignant, I think it has a lot of good to say about the way we pray to God. And Stuart told him this. He says, sobriety is a new way of living, looking at yourself and others, learning what is true surrender, owning what's on your side of the street, and turning yourself over to the care of God. And speaking of God, he tells him, he said, I don't want you to give me a bunch of churchy stuff. I'm a Christian, and I'll smell you trying to put a church patch on this a mile off. This isn't about whether you believe a certain doctrine. Your position on baptism didn't keep you sober. And this is what he says. This is about whether you want to meet God on his terms, not yours, and quit preaching to him and calling it prayer. Praying for his will to be done and the courage and wisdom to live in it and with it is what this program is about. We don't tell God what to do here. And I've always, that has always, ever since I read that, it has always resonated me and made me sit back and think, hmm, do I preach at God in my prayer? And I sometimes sit there and I'm like, okay, I'm even praying in the middle of my prayer. And I'm thinking, you know what? I'm like, kind of like telling God what he already knows. <laughs> Instead of saying, God, give me what I need. Help me to understand. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says this, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Each day, God calls us to ask for the grace to seek his kingdom rather than our own and to serve those he places in our path rather than serving ourselves. Romans 12, 16 tells us to live in harmony with each other, Paul writes. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. <laughs> and that wasn't a problem for the tax collector. He knew his need very well, such that the only prayer... He felt he, that he could or should pray in that moment was a prayer for mercy. It's the only, he's like, the only thing I can ask God for is mercy. The tax collector knows he's fully at the mercy of God. He's come to that point. He's come to that point of humility. Whereas the, the Pharisee's prayer is full of self-congratulations, there's only one prayer the tax collector dares to pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's full surrender. It's full vulnerability. It's a full emptying of pride. This man recognizes he is fully powerless and that any good, any redemption, any life, any forgiveness is only going to come to him by the choice of God to bestow it upon him. His, he has right-sized himself in the universe. He's come to the full recognition that he is the creation, not the creator. And that in the, here's the shocking moment. But, you know, he's in this moment of full realization that even though he is the creation, he has chosen to turn his back on the creator and put himself in a very perilous position by his unholiness, his own living in destructive ways. Tax collectors were some of the most despised people in the culture of that day. Whereas the Pharisee would have actually been seen as one of the most respected people, a respected religious leader. The Jewish people saw tax collectors as traitors and thieves. And that's why it was so easy for the Pharisee to look down on him, even as he's sitting in the temple praying to God. Because that's what everybody did. Everybody looked down and despised the tax. It was an easy target. It's easy to prop yourself up against the guy that everybody sits there and says, you know what, man, they are the lowest of the low. And a lot of times we take advantage of that. They were seen as traitors because they worked for the occupying Roman government, collecting the taxes. And they were seen as thieves because, honestly, they would often tax people above what was required by the government so they could po put pocket some of it themselves. It was an openly dishonest trade. It was. I mean, it, it, was, it was not wholesome behavior that these all were involved in. But this guy knows it. He senses it. He, he's been convicted by it. When I counsel people, I often find this to be true. The people who have all the appearances of being broken and ostracized, the things that we would kind of like typecast people, people who have all those appearances and all those sort of traits, often rarely need someone to remind them of that fact. They understand it so much more than we ever give them credit for it. Often the people who need the truth like a two-by-four to the head are those of us, many times religious folks, who are imposters. 
who always are putting forward a glittering image of ourselves to the world, that when we know deep down we are just as screwed up as everyone else. And if we don't know that today, I pray that God will get us to that conclusion as fast as possible. Because when we get there, that's where life begins. At the gift of desperation, where the gospel finally becomes good news for us. Where I can't afford to keep the glittering image alive anymore, and all I can do is ask God for mercy every day. That's where life begins. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Thirdly today, understanding ourselves as the objects of mercy breeds compassion. It breeds compassion. In Matthew 7, 3 through 5, Jesus gives us some very, very critical teaching. He says this, And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. The Pharisee looks down at the tax collector because he hasn't dealt with the log in his own eye. If he had he'd realize that he's in as much need of God's mercy as the tax collector was. That it really, the the ground at the cross is level, and and there's an equal need for everyone. And there would no longer, when you get to that point, there's no longer any use for comparisons. For as we said at the outset, I don't have time to hate your sin, because hating my own sin is a full-time job for me. How about you hate your sin, and and I'll hate my sin, and, and we'll love each other. The reason the tax collector's prayer is heard and his relationship with God is restored is that he's the only one who walked in with brokenness. He's the only one who walked in with an appreciation for what God could give. The Pharisee's not concerned about anything God can give him. He doesn't think God, he needs anything from God. But the, the tax collector needs everything from God. That's the only hope, it's the only life raft he's got. As Daryl Bach also states, bravado and appearance mean nothing. Resume and social status mean nothing. Self-reliance means nothing. What counts is a heart that appreciates what God can give. Do we appreciate what God can give us today? Be content to approach God only as the object of his mercy. Be content to approach God only as as the object of his mercy. It's a much freer way to live when we're simply submitting ourselves to God and not trying to do so for the rest of the world. On a sweltering summer night in New Orleans, 16 recovering alcoholics and drug addicts gather for their weekly AA meeting. Although several members attend other meetings during the week, this is their home group. They have been meeting on Tuesday nights for several years, and they know each other well. Some talk to each other daily on the telephone. Others socialize outside the meetings. The personal investment in one another's sobriety is sizable. Nobody fools anybody else. Everyone is there because they have, everyone is there because he or she has made a slobbering mess of his or her life and is trying to put the pieces back together. Each meeting is marked by levity and seriousness. Some members are wealthy, others middle class or poor, some smokes, others don't, most drink coffee. Some have graduate degrees, others have not yet finished high school. For one small hour, the high and mighty descend and the lowly rise, and the result is fellowship. The meeting opened with the serenity prayer, followed by a moment of silence. The prologue to Alcoholics Anonymous was read from the big book by Harry, followed by the 12 steps of the program from Michelle. That night, Jack was the appointed leader. He said, the theme I would like to talk about tonight is gratitude, he began. But if anyone wants to talk about anything else, let's hear it. Immediately, Phil's hand shot up. He said, as you all know, last week I went up to Pennsylvania to visit family and I missed the meeting. You also know that I've been sober for the last seven years But last Monday, I got drunk and stayed drunk for five days. The only sound in the room at that point was the drip of Mr. Coffee back in the corner. (laughs) He says, 
you all know the, the buzzword HALT in this program, H-A-L-T in this program, he continued. Don't let yourself get hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, or you'll be very vulnerable for the first drink. And he said to the group, he said, the last three got to me. I unplugged the jug, and, and before he could continue on, his voice choked, and he lowered his head. He glanced around the table, and, and there were moist eyes everywhere, tears of compassion, tears that had been there, sobbing, the only sound in the room. Another man piped up. The same thing happened to me, Phil, but I stayed drunk for a year. Another person said, thank God you're back. Another person said, boy, that took a lot of guts. Another person who's a substance abuse counselor in the group said, that relapse spells relief. Let's get together tomorrow and figure out why you, what you needed relief from and why. Another person, I'm so proud of you. Another guy says, hey, I, I never even made it close to seven years of sobriety. And as the meeting ended... Phil stood up. He felt a hand on his shoulder, another on his face, then kisses on his eyes, forehead, neck, and cheek. You old ragamuffin, said Denise, let's go. I'm treating you to a banana split at Tasty Threes. When we understand deeply our own need for God's mercy, our hearts are freed to let God do the fixing and to love other people well. That's a picture right there of a group of people who realize they all walked into the room saying, you know, we all need God's mercy today. And when that man came forward and he said, you know what, I, I relapsed big time. You see the evidence of what that humility in the way that they reacted to him. No one tried to fix him in the moment. No one sat there and tried to, you know, try to problem solve and, or, or say, man, you shoulda, 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 shoulda. They just said, you know what, we know. We've been there, we love you, and we're glad that you came back and that God's still working in your life like he's still working in us. When we understand deeply our own need for God's mercy, our hearts are free to let him do the fixing and to love others well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, and I just simply want to, I want to thank you, Lord, for your great mercy Father, that seems to maybe to be the only prayer that's appropriate to pray. Have mercy on us, Lord. There is nothing that we have inherently done in ourselves to be deserving of your mercy. There's nothing we have done to earn your mercy. There is nothing, Lord, that we have done to accomplish it for ourselves. It is simply and solely at the direction of your grace at the direction of your will, that we receive anything redemptive, that we receive forgiveness, that we receive life. Lord, it is all by your hand, and it is by your choice, a choice you don't have to make, a choice, Lord, that you would be completely justified to not make and to send us into judgment for eternity because of what we have done. But, Father, because you choose to give us mercy, we have it in Christ. That's it. So, Father, we simply come before you asking for mercy. And today, I pray that you would, if there is in any part of us pride, if in any part of us a lack of humility, I pray, Lord, that your light, the light of your word, would shine on that corner of our life and, and, and expose it. Not for, not for shame, not for embarrassment, but for life healing, hope, to no longer let things drift and wait in the darkness, but to let them come to your loving, your warm light, that you may take us by the hand, and that we may grab onto that hand and let you lead us, maybe through some painful things, Lord, but in the end, lead us to life. Father, we thank you for the great and awesome gift of your mercy today. May we know it, may we feel it, may we experience it, and simply by surrendering before you. We love you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, as we enter our time of decision, if you have a decision, perhaps 
you say, wow, I just need to utter that prayer. And maybe that's my prayer today. I came in and I just needed God. And I just need to come before him and say, God, have mercy on me. And you just, maybe you need to start that relationship with Jesus where, you know, that mercy starts to mean something, where it means eternal life. And, and it's a gateway to that. Whatever your choice, whatever your decision today, make that choice. You, even if you make it in the pew today, make that choice Begin to walk in whatever step of faith he is asking you to walk with him in today. Let's stand together and sing and worship.
this is Sarah Lawson. And, yeah, go ahead, sit down. Uh, I am, whew, uh, I, she came forward this past Sunday uh, night and was just like, Clay, I want to talk to you. And I was like, please, 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 please. And, and she was like, uh, I, yeah, uh, she's like, I, I I think I want to go ahead and, and get baptized. I was like, it's about time. Because, uh, I mean, she's been with us, uh, and she I could just tell that God was stirring in her heart. Um, and she was ready to make that decision, and I'm so happy to be able to, uh, to help her do that. So uh, we're all going to repeat together, but you repeat after me, okay? That great confession. Okay. We believe. We believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. And we believe that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. Awesome. Congratulations, Sarah. We're so proud of you and I look forward to congratulating her after the service's conclusion today. Uh, great to see another, another soul basically walking in, uh, embracing that promise uh, that we have in Jesus Christ. And so we're very, very thankful for her decision today. I have a couple of other decisions today I want to make you aware of. Mark, if you would can't come up here. Mark, this is Mark Purdom. And uh, Mark's been worshiping with us for now like five months and things, and actually even came forward a couple weeks ago to kind of say, hey, I need to kind of rededicate myself to Christ. And today he comes forward to say, this is my family. This is, the, this is where I want to worship. Um, and uh, absolutely. And uh, he's an immersed believer in Christ. And he, he said, this is where I want to put my membership. And so uh, we are thankful. He's, he's kind of jumped in with both feet already, you know, with a lot of things. Uh, and I got a chance to work alongside him in the work day, you know, a few months back and stuff. And we hot. had a good old day. It was hot. It was hot. <laughs> Believe it or not, those were the days it was warm outside. And, uh, but no, we had a good time. So I want to go ahead and take a moment here just to uh, welcome him into our fellowship and to do so by repeating with him that great confession that you just heard there a minute ago. Let's, let's go ahead and let's do that here with Mark today as well. We believe, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God. the Son of the living God, and we believe, we believe that, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And all God's people did, said, Amen. 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 All right. Everybody. Welcome, Mark, after the service today. Yeah, good to have you, bud. All right, this is Aiden, right? Aiden, come on up here. Aiden Davis, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, Aiden come forward. He's actually been, he's a good friend of our buddy Stephen Moore, right there. And uh, he and Stephen have been having conversations. Teenagers leading each other to Jesus. Like, and uh, I've known, yeah, I, I love you, buddy. <laughs> I've known him since he was like, yeah, so uh, proud of him. But also Aiden coming forward today. And, and just saying, you know, I, I want to make my life right with Christ. I want to start this, this step of getting closer to him and things. And so he comes forward today simply to say, I want to start that. I want to start that. And I want to start talking about with you, you know, what does it look like to get immersed? What is that about? And so uh, we're just going to start walking alongside him in that decision today and talk with him a little bit here following today, I think, to, to kind of solidify, you know, where, where things are there. But what a great step of faith for him to come forward today and say what, again, the, the same recognition of the tax collector today as all of us, I hope, have made in our, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I need you. I need you. And so we want to just, we just want to sit there and rejoice with the decision that he has made here today as well. And uh, I want to offer up just a word of prayer for all the decisions we've seen today. So if you would join me in prayer today, we'll, we'll go ahead and go before our Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, uh, Lord, I thank you so much for the decision of Aiden to come forward and to say, you know what, I want to, I just want to know more. I want to follow you more closely. I want to know what it looks like to take that next step. 
Uh, I thank you, Father, for the faith that he showed just to come forward today. I thank you, Father, for the way that you've been working in Mark's life uh, and, and how you have led him to see this as his family. Uh, and we're, we are touched and honored and, frankly, humbled that, uh, for that because, again, we're all people in need of your mercy. We know how broken and messed up we are. Uh, and yet, by your grace, you bring, that's what the church is, Lord, you bring together all of us who are broken and hurting, and you bring us together in your grace and your mercy and cover us with the blood of Jesus uh, and, and the promise of life. Father, and of course, we rejoice with Sarah today, so proud of her, the decision that she made to give her life to you. Lord, we ask that you be with her now as, as she begins this journey that we know, Lord, it is not an easy journey at all times, but Lord, it is the journey of hope. There is always hope with Jesus. And we thank you for that. We pray your blessing upon her as she begins that walk. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Again, thank you for your mercy. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well. Wonderful day it's already been and look forward to uh, many more days I hope to uh, be witnesses of the good things that's happened here this morning <sighs> today I'd like to share a community meditation about a shared table uh, get my eyeballs up here where I can see when we think of the communion, about the communion, we often talk about who Jesus is and what he's done for us individually. In light of today's message, we should be also thinking about the corporate dimension when we celebrate communion. What promises does God make to us as a body when we eat and drink? What are we saying and acknowledging to one another when we partake? The Lord's Supper is a community meal. It brings the New Covenant people together at this table where we can look at each other in the eye as we're united by grace as equals. All of us have nothing apart from Christ. We are all knit together and have been rescued by Christ. All of us are sinners with nothing to boast about except for the lavish grace that we have received. This is the common ground that leads us to this table. I'm reminded of what the Apostle John said in his epistle, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, when he says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and with the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John says that what disrupts fellowship and breeds isolation is unforgived sin or unconfessed sin. Sin keeps us in the dark. By being in the dark, it keeps us in fellowship. We're tempted to duck back into the shadows and hide from the light. The closer we get to people and the more light that shines on us, the more they see how ugly and broken that we really are. We're tempted to avoid being honest with one another about our sins and we deny our need for grace. When it's our sinfulness and reliance upon that grace that Jesus that unites us in the first place. However, ever rightly understanding the freeness and the fullness of the gospel teaches us that we have no reason to hide. A gospel of grace frees us from the fear of cre created by living and trying to be perfect by works or by our performance. We bring all of our sin, our shame, our failings, our regretful thoughts, all of our deeds and we give it to Jesus, every last bit of it. Honesty about our sin, paired with our power of the gospel, allows us to move into the light rather than feel trapped and hidden in darkness. 
We, put, we don't have to pretend about our goodness, but we can admit it, that we are wretched, that we are messy, that we are sinful. We step into the light by confessing our sin, by saying Jesus is the one who is so perfect and so pure that I can be entirely washed. We don't have to withdraw or scatter out of fear that our sins will find us out because we have already been found out. We don't have to withdraw. We walk in the light honestly and unbelief, bringing our sins to the cross and saying we have been found out and now we need you to forgive us, Lord. In this freedom of the gospel, we can actually rejoice in being found out. All of our sin, all of us are sinners because we have, from that place of brokenness, we can find full forgiveness in Jesus. Because we now know every, he knows everything about us. And in his grace, the only thing that can help us and the only thing we can boast about is that we are in Christ. We walk boldly in that light because we are all redeemed together. This is not my story. This is not just your story. It's all of our stories. We've placed our faith in Jesus. We walk in the light as people who have confessed their sins, who are now following Jesus, unites us. Grace is the glue that's keeping us together as God's people. This morning, we're going to take the cup and the bread and so together, we're also confessing that we are sinners whose joy is in the Savior who cleanses us from all sin. Let us pray. Father God, we do thank you this morning for us having a means to come before you because of your love, your mercy, and your grace. Your shed blood that cleanses us. Father, that we are all alike. None of us are perfect. Lord, I humbly offer myself before you and open in my sin, thanking you that you are the one and only perfect person who can save us. Father, this morning as we eat and as we drink, may it be a nourishment to our souls. And may we be uh, amazed by your Holy Spirit and how he works in our lives and how he guides us through that life that leads to eternity. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, what a great day to be in together as the family of God. Amen. I really enjoy being here and seeing again just what God is doing and he, you know, he just is an amazing God and uh wow, what a great thing to to be a part of his kingdom just because again of his mercy. A few things to announce, just or just remind everybody of before we leave today and dismiss. Of course, first of all, we just want to remind everybody of the ways in which we can participate with generosity in the work God is doing from a financial perspective. Uh, God uh, does talk about that a lot in Scripture, uh, and it's important spiritual discipline. There are ways you can give. You can give online. You can give at the offering boxes at the rear of the room, the P.O. box, and all of that goes not just for things that are happening here, which we have a full schedule. If you look at Nick's notes, you'll see that the week is full every week of things happening here, but also it's about the things we support, the work God is doing around the world and simply supporting the work of his kingdom. Also, I want to remind everybody that following our service today is the Kids Space Holiday Open House. Uh, after the conclusion of the service, there will be cider and cookies in the cafe area out here. There will also be homemade ornaments on the trees in Kids Space. If you want to go back in Kids Space, the kids are going to be taking donations uh, to help with paving, the Paving the Way campaign, uh, our capital campaign that we've been involved in the latter part of this year. And so this is their way of contributing uh, to that, is this open house and the ornaments and things that they've made. So we encourage you to go back there, make a donation, and enjoy some of the treats that they've worked on and the, the ornaments that they've worked on as well uh, back there in Kid Space after the service today. Also, ladies, uh, coming up this Wednesday is the Wings Ladies Ministry meeting. They'll be meeting at 6.30 p.m. I think they'll be uh, talking about some of the upcoming activities and things, uh, decorating for Christmas and things like that that'll be going on. Uh, and so I want to encourage you ladies to be a part of that coming up Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, celebrate recovery. Uh, we did a lot of the talking today about and some references to stories of people in recovery, but I want to remind everybody of our Celebrate Recovery ministry that meets every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. There's a meal, a, meal, a free meal at, fi at uh, 5.45 p.m. right before that here in the uh, Ministry Activity Center. So I encourage you to be here on Thursdays. And this is not just for people dealing with substance abuse. This is for every hurt, hang-up, and habit that you have in life that you say, you know what, I want. I know God wants more for me in this area of my life, and I want to give that to him. So whatever it is, it could be a lot of things, workaholism, or different things uh, that you're going through in life, I encourage you to, to, to check out Celebrate Recovery. For this coming Friday night, also, there is a Christmas concert that's open to the community here at Northside at 6.30 p.m., we encourage you to come and enjoy a number of local musical artists uh, who will be performing in that concert. Dean Weddle and things is putting that all to, together here. And so uh, his Grace Times Four Quartet will be among those groups. Uh, and so I encourage you to come and enjoy that if you're looking for a way just to kind of enjoy in song as we enter into this holiday season. Last thing I want to ask as usual, if you're physically able to help us, we need to stack all the chairs today following the service and stack them all on this wall over here to my right. So if you can help us with that, we'd greatly appreciate that. And with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Wayne will lead us, and then we'll be dismissed. You're an awesome God, Father, and we just thank you for this time that we have had together today to worship you. Thank you for the decisions that have been made. Father, we pray that in all that we do, we will honor and glorify you. We love you, we praise you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.